Welcome to worship here at Discovery Church. It's good to be able to connect with you again as we continue in the book of Daniel today. Here in what has been an absolutely gorgeous fall. The colors have been incredible and I hope wherever you may be today that you've had the opportunity to be able to get out and just celebrate God by watching the changes take place in the beautiful creation that's around us. I know I can just look out my office window and there is a set of woods where you've got the yellow of the birch trees against the red oaks. It's been good just to be able to look at that and to pray and thank God for his goodness in our lives. Even as we think about fall, though, and enjoy it, we have to be thinking about Christmas, and it's uh, time once again for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, Boxes are available here at the church, so you can pick up one or a dozen or a hundred, if you'd like, and be able to put together some special gifts, and there are some specifications, so make sure you follow those things that um, some things just shouldn't be uh, included in the box, and so... You need to make sure as you do your shopping uh, that you're buying the right things to be able to bless the life of a child in another part of the world and in the process be able to share the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ with them. Here at the Discovery Church, we're back with many more of the regular activities uh, continuing On Sunday mornings now, we have something uh, for everyone during the worship hour, and then from preschool all the way through the oldest of adults during discovery hour time. Wednesday night activities are continuing, so while it may not be normal, there are a lot of regular activities that are in process, and you're able to join in as you are ready and willing to be a part of that. That's all a part of God's faithfulness to us. As uh, we've moved through all of this and even as we're involved in uh, an election season, we can take comfort as children of God that we serve him, that his kingdom is first and foremost. That's an idea that really comes through clearly in the book of Daniel, that it's the kingdom of God that matters, that he is faithful to us, that he watches over us, and all he asks is that we live faithfully for him and his faithfulness will be poured out on us. We're able to celebrate that when we give an offering. And so we're going to just pray right now before we do anything else in this service, thanking God for his faithfulness and once again just giving him our love as we worship him. Join with me as I pray. Our great God, you are indeed faithful. And we thank you that uh, we serve you and that as we serve you in your kingdom, that you look upon us as we serve you faithfully and you just uh, pour out your faithfulness upon us. Uh, Scripture uses words like you lavish us with your super abundance. We give you praise for being that kind of good, gracious, loving God. We know we're not worthy. But that's exactly why you sent Jesus Christ, your son, to this earth, to be able to make that way that we could become children of God. And as John exclaimed in his first letter, and so we are, indeed we are children of God. As your children, we count it a privilege to be able to exercise faithfulness in return to you. And so each week, we just thank you for being able to bless us with those provisions to be able to live our lives. And as a part of that, we just return part of that to be able to faithfully express our love to you in a very tangible way. So as we're able to give, God, we thank you that uh, you bless. And indeed, in many ways, you do multiply the effect of those gifts to be able to impact the lives of people here in our area and indeed around the world. Thank you again for your word and that we're able to look into it and learn and benefit from it. We're ready to be able to do that today as we worship you in the great name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I really-
is a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. So I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear.
when I began in ministry after graduating from seminary, I was told that only 40% of us would actually make it all the way to where we would retire from ministry. The last time I checked, and it was about 15 years ago, there were only three or four of us left from among the 70 or so graduates in my class. That number comes far closer to more recent reports stating that only one out of 10 graduates will actually retire as a minister. 50% won't even make it five years. The disturbing part of pastors leaving ministry involves the reasons for doing so. Now, some decided they'd made a mistake in their career choice, and so that's understandable that they would leave, and I've had some friends where that was the decision that they made. Others made their decision because of difficulties in dealing with people, and they just decided it wasn't worth doing it anymore, and that really leads to the third group where they just became so discouraged that they decided it wasn't worth the hassle. The final group involves those disqualified for moral reasons. And in those cases, it would be best for the minister to leave their position. You may have seen some disturbing reports the past few months involving ministry professionals who compromised moral standards. Uh, There have been some shocking headlines, some disturbing pictures, and they either resigned or they were removed from their position. When examining what happened and why, the issues resulting in their eventual removal, they could be traced back to some deviations in behavior that began small and then increased in magnitude over time. They compromised, and from there everything began to unravel. Compromise leading to sin is a powerful force. Temptation is real. Personal integrity is often sacrificed, often for the opportunity to get ahead. This pull toward compromising standards, it's a voice that we all hear. We're told that if we're going to get ahead, it's necessary maybe to bend a few rules, or above all else, make sure that you look out for yourself. Take care of number one. In the first chapter of Daniel, we've seen an account that establishes a very distinct, sharp contrast between the people of God and the world's system of ethics. Uh, Daniel and his three friends that we've met over the last couple of weeks, they were faced with a choice. Will we do it God's way or the way that's being commanded by the king? If they simply followed Nebuchadnezzar's formula, they were sure to get ahead. At least that is what they were supposed to think. Daniel and his three friends They committed fully to following God's way and doing His will. And that's been the focus of the past two weeks. We will see, as a result, how God rewarded Daniel for his faith and how he received many more benefits, I believe, than he would have received taking the easy way from obeying God. That convenient course of compromise is one it doesn't necessarily pay off like we'd like to think. The options that Daniel faced, they're the same kinds of options that we have today. As we live in our culture, if we make the commitment that Daniel made, it may be difficult. It's likely to be difficult. But we can count on God to take care of us. Those people who commit to God's best, receive God's best, and in the process, we become God's best. Pause with me to pray right there. God, what a privilege it would be to be considered among your best. And you've made it clear to be able to be there that what we have to do is we have to be 
committed to pursuing your best. Your best for our lives, your best for our communities, your best for our church, your best for your world. You've made it clear in Scripture what that involves. And you've just asked that we would be willing to follow. Father God, my prayer is in my life that you would find that to be as true as it can be. That that would be true in the lives of, uh, life of our church, the lives of the people who are a part of Discovery Church. That God, that you would find that to be true among your people here in this nation. That as we live in the midst of difficult, up and down, crazy kinds of times, that your people, that your people would be ready, willing, and available to pursue your best at all times in order to point people, to point people to you. God, I would pray that for our nation that your church would be that kind of beacon, that you would find your churches across this land filled with Daniels who have resolved to follow you. God, make that the case in our lives today. To your glory, always for your glory. Amen. Amen. I hope you're able to add your amen to that and desire to be one of God's best. Make sure now you don't miss these next few thoughts. I'm not talking today about a health and wealth gospel that portrays God as a kind of cosmic candy machine who dispenses goodies to those who please him. Not only is that contrary to our observations as we live life and our own personal experiences, it's contrary to the teaching of God's word. Here's what I'm asking you to consider. One of the reasons why people have so many problems living as Christians is the result of trying to keep one foot, this is the picture I have, one foot on God's side of the street while keeping the other foot on the opposite side. This pull to compromise, the pull to compromise drags us down into the ruts of spiritual mediocrity. Here's the point I'm asking you to consider. Consider what would happen if we would commit ourselves, no matter what people say, no matter what it costs, to live with the commitment where God's word draws the line is where I'm going to draw the line. Consider the difference that would make. It doesn't make any difference what the competition does or how others play the game. This is what I will do because a person who is sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ always wins. In this first chapter where we've been for three weeks now, this is the fourth week, we have seen how Daniel was immediately faced with the choice to compromise. His resolve not to defile himself with the choice of wine and food offered by the king, that was a risky choice. Uh, but Daniel, you see how he approached this. He was careful to interact humbly with his captors. He offered another way to be tested for a trial period of 10 days. He didn't come in demanding. He offered other ways to do it. And they would be able to evaluate, evaluate the results and then he would accept, he said he would accept whatever their conclusions were. Daniel was expectant. He was expectant that God would honor his resolve to honor him. Now, God might, do, might not do this as dramatically for us when we make that kind of resolution, but he will always act on behalf of those who honor him. So as I read verses 15 to 21 today, watch for the benefit of God's faithfulness that Daniel and his three friends receive. Now this comes just after it's been agreed that the testing period would take place for 10 days. We now get the result of that experiment. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So 
the guard took away the choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel, Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. That's going to come into play in chapter 2 in a big way. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These are the three young men we've met who are also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with their Babylonian names. He found none equal to them, so they entered the king's service. Now listen to this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So it doesn't take long for the benefits of following God to become noticeable. They suggested this 10-day trial, and when the 10 days were completed, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier, and they were better nourished than all of those who had taken the easy, convenient way. They had compromised and gone along with the plan to eat the king's food. Now, vegetarians are no doubt cheering at this point in the account. We don't actually know what they were eating. The NIV, the New International Version, says vegetables. The King James Version says it was something called pulse. And the speculation there it was a form of uh, cereal. So you, you know the often suggested uh, health routine, eat your oatmeal. Yeah, it seems like oatmeal will solve all your health problems. Just eat your oatmeal. Daniel would have been a perfect candidate for a large endorsement contract. Eat Pulse, the breakfast of champions. I can only imagine how the compromised crowd felt about what happens next. The guards come and they take away all the choice foods of their rich diets and make them eat what Daniel and his three friends have been eating. I can see their faces. The first time this new menu is placed before them. Hey, where are those camel steaks we've been eating? Well, it was pulse from now on for them. And so another of the immediate benefits was not just how it helped Daniel and his three friends. Another immediate benefit was how God used Daniel to bring the others who had compromised back into obeying the divine standards. They had made their choices, they had compromised, possibly forfeited God's blessing, but because of Daniel, they now have to obey and follow God's direction. Now, it wasn't the food that made Daniel and his friends better. It was God blessing them because of their determination to honor God and to do what was right. For doing that, God faithfully honors their faithfulness. This food test, it seems like such a little thing. You've probably found this to be true. It's often the little things that lead to bigger failures. If they had failed here, maybe God would have given them another chance. Maybe not. This could have been the end of the story and all that we would ever know about Daniel. But they honored God, and so the story goes on. Uh, the immediate benefits involve more than just coming up best on the food test. Look again at verse 17 here on the screen. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Uh, they had special insight and wisdom. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. He had a special insights that were given. As a result of that obedience, the special abilities, the special abilities, they are going to be of strategic importance in, as the future in the story unfolds. The special knowledge, the understanding from God regarding all types of literature, and Daniel having that unique ability to be able to understand dreams and visions. God is doing something here in this story through these four determined young men. 
What would have happened if they'd failed this first test? They would have almost certainly failed the greater test that would be encountered in the future. And so these special abilities, they are unlocked to be able to play a prominent part. Now, before we lead this, I just would, I want to turn to Psalm 25. It's a, a wonderful psalm. If you haven't read it, it's, a, it's, you should read it this afternoon or this evening whenever you're watching this. I want all of us to see a verse that should humble us and thrill us at the same time. Look at verse 14. We are told there, the Lord confides in those who fear him, those who honor him, those who respect him. He makes his covenant known to them. Do you understand what this verse is saying? Those who fear God become his confidants. He makes his covenant known to them. They're enabled to understand his ways. For example, in Genesis 18, you may remember there how God takes Abraham into his confidence. He tells Abraham what he's planning to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is then able to intercede with God. And God considers Abraham's plea for these two sin-filled cities. That privilege only comes as a result of fearing and obeying God. God made Abraham his confidant. So as the immediate benefits are realized, Daniel and his three friends, they are learning about God. They are learning about the nature of temptation, perhaps their own points of personal vulnerability to compromise. We need to know those. They were also learning the faithfulness of God and his ability to keep them safe. And they were going to need to understand that in dramatic ways as the book of Daniel continues. God demonstrates that truth as the benefits of their obedience are quickly realized and they rise to the top. Only a glimpse of the far greater demonstrations still to come. We still can't leave this point of receiving knowledge and understanding from God yet. Because as a part of their understanding, I wonder, I wonder if the words written by Isaiah, a contemporary, if those words came to their minds as they remembered the prophecy that Isaiah had delivered when he foresaw the coming exile where they'd be taken into Babylon. In Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, I'm just going to read, so you're going to have to listen carefully. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says. So listen. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had little idea how literally these words would be realized in their futures when they would face the flames. In the meantime, in the meantime, they're learning how faithful God is so that when that fiery moment came, they would be ready. They committed themselves to the promises of God. There is no other way to discover whether or not he keeps his promises. The promises of God are only words until we stake our lives on them. Our convictions about the reliability of his word and our willingness to follow are not theoretical matters. When we trust God, and follow him, we grow. We grow and he, we are better prepared. He prepares us for future challenges. That's all a part of the immediate benefits when we follow God. Well, the benefits continued for those who honor God. We see some midterm benefits that came at the conclusion of their three-year training course when it was time for their final exam. 
those final exams. Oh, you face them in life as well as the classroom. There had to be a mixture of excitement and fear in being called to appear before King Nebuchadnezzar himself. The chief official, he's completed his assignment, and now they're going to find out whether or not they make the cut. After questioning them, Nebuchadnezzar found four. Four who stood head and shoulders above the others. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They placed at the top of the class. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as these four. So they entered the royal service. They were placed into positions of service, and those positions are going to increase in prominence with time. For me, there is a question that hangs over this scene. What happened to those who chose the course of compromise? Nothing is said here as to whether they made it or not. The implication seems to be that they didn't. They compromised, thinking it was the quickest way to get ahead, and were left behind. One has to wonder what opportunities existed for a foreigner who washed out of the program. Uh, the prospects couldn't have been that good for them. For you and me, it's strange how we can think that the easiest, quickest way is also the best way to succeed. We watch God here use people of principle, and we see how the world respects those who embrace godly values. It was true in a hostile environment like Babylon, and it's true today. Oh, there will be opposition. You can count on that. Daniel and his three friends, they encountered fierce opposition. But what we see is that God reserves his best for his best. These men were being prepared for great roles. Great, great roles. Nebuchadnezzar found not only were they at the top of the class, but they were also at the top of all those who were his royal advisors. Verse 20, whenever the king consulted them, consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Ten is the number of completion. This says there was absolutely no comparison. By honoring God, they were placed in positions where they had the complete trust of the one considered to be the most powerful person in the world. That's what God rewarded them with. Finally, we see future benefits. The consequences of a single, faith-prompted commitment provided lifetime benefits. To see this, we need to link verse 21 to verse 8. Verse 8 has been uh, involved in both of the previous two weeks. It really sets the tone for the entire book of Daniel this chapter, but the whole book. It's the verse where we read, but Daniel resolved. Some of the versions say determined. The word resolved actually means he determined in advance. He was ready ahead of time. What did he determine? Not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. And then the test unfolds from there, and it brings us eventually to verse 21, where we read, As a result of that resolution, that determination, we read, And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Have you thought about that? How long that is? 
Daniel lived and served from 605 B.C. through the remainder of the Babylonian Empire and on into the Empire of the Persians in 539, and he saw the return of the captives to Judah in the year 537, seven decades of service as a result of that one committed decision that he had made. Think about during that time the infighting and the positioning that takes place in high government circles. Daniel faces that. And it was just as true in Daniel's time as it is today. It was just more ruthless then. Uh, You could be thrown into a fiery furnace or into a lion's den if you were found to be out of the uh, popular uh, place of opinion. His opponents, they tried to have him killed for his faith. But year after year, Daniel remained and his influence grew. In closing this message, I'm going to utilize a bit of sanctified imagination. I don't know if what comes next, what I'm suggesting, if it's true. Just asking you to go ahead and imagine it with me. When King Cyrus and the Persians take control, King Cyrus authorized the initial return of the Jewish people to their land to be able to return to Jerusalem. He released them from their bondage. You can read about that in Ezra chapter 1. Is it possible, I wonder, that Daniel's last official act was to prepare the papers for Cyrus to sign that released his people from their captivity? Could he have had the privilege of being able to do that? Journey ahead with me now 500 plus years to the small Judean town of Bethlehem, Centuries have passed since Daniel lived out his testimony to God's faithfulness as the wisest of the wise men in Babylon. In Matthew 2, we are told certain wise men from the east came seeking the one who'd been born the king of the Jews. Uh, They didn't have all the details. Uh, You've heard this enough at Christmas time. You know, they didn't have all the details. But they had seen his star, and they arrived wanting to worship this one. Think about this. How did they know anything at all about a promised Messiah, a king of the Jews? Now, again, we don't know anything for certain. But could we perhaps trace the roots of their search back to Daniel? Back to Daniel, the wisest of the wise men. I don't think the idea is improbable. That means that unborn generations, unborn generations felt the impact of his faithful, godly testimony because he resolved not to defile himself. The history of the Christian church abounds with illustrations of men and women whose lives had an effect on the advance of the kingdom of God because of their resolution and their constant faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Many of them lived far away from centers of influence, those places in our world that we see as this is where it's happening. They served God in difficult, undesirable places. There was nothing appealing about Babylon for Daniel. His heart was in Jerusalem. He faced Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, and he ended up in a den full of hungry lions because of his refusal to compromise. That's not a pretty picture. But while he was in Babylon, for as long as that might be, he committed himself to faithfully fulfill God's purpose. And he is living proof that it's not who you are or where you are that's important to God's plan. It's what you are as a person of God. Faithfulness, not reputation or circumstances, that is what counts in God's kingdom. Oh, for the good of our world today that he would find us 
faithful. Oh, that he would find us faithful. When we're faithful, you can be sure that you will receive God's best. That is his promise to Daniel, and it's his promise to you. Today, rather than closing in a prayer where I bow my head and pray, I'm going to move ahead and take words that were written by Peter. The Apostle Peter, during another time when the people of God were suffering for their testimony under Roman rule, And I want to pronounce this as a benediction of God's blessing upon you. That this would be true of you and me as we live for our God. Here is the blessing I believe God has for us today. But you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do His work and speak out for Him, to tell others of the night and day difference He made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, This world is not your home. So don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. God has promised you the power to be able to do that. He has promised you the presence of his spirit to give you wisdom, to give you guidance. Do and be God's person as you live, as you live for him. Amen. God bless you.